Welcome, my name is Rob Oxendorf, a program officer in the Division of Research on Learning. I work um, in the DRK-12 program. Good afternoon or good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Welcome to this session entitled A Year in Crisis, Impacts and Inequities in American Families, Schools and Communities. We are pleased to be joined today for today's session by three outstanding research teams and our distinguished discussant, Dr. Pedro Noguera. Early in the pandemic, NSF quickly shifted gears and began awarding rapid response grants um, to address pressing needs in the research field across many fields. To date, NSF has awarded nearly a thousand rapid awards addressing critical COVID questions. These projects have addressed issues related to machine learning for chest scans, intramolecular bonding in the COVID spike protein, and probing the wastewater microbiome to monitor seasonal COVID cycles, just to name a few examples. The PIs presenting in today's session receive rapid grants from the Division of Research on Learning, and their work focuses on issues related to COVID and social justice. Our first presenters, uh, Anna Saavedra and Morgan Polakoff are from USC and they will present data from nationally representative sample of families of K-12 students. Their work has been featured in many prominent news outlets and has helped shape the narrative around COVID and K-12 for many months now. As I turn things over to Anna to get us started, a reminder to please enter your questions in the chat feature. Uh, presenters will be able to answer questions as we go along, but there will also be time at the end for more in-depth questions and discussions. So Anna, I will turn things over to you to uh, share screen and we'll go from there. There we go. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be able to share our work here. Um, Morgan and I are so happy to be here on behalf of our, of our team who is really great uh, and we couldn't do it without them. Um, so we're going to be talking about the uh, educational experiences of American families, um, particularly with um, those with K-12 children in the household. We've been serving the same parents over time since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so I work at a research center at USC called the Center for Economic and Social Research. And CSER, as we call it, has been serving the same household over time since 2014. We have a, a lot of information on our, <laughs> on our panelists. Um, and we've, we've been surveying our panelists every two weeks since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so the research we're gonna be presenting as part of this pandemic study, uh, pand um, pandemic tracking survey. Some households don't have access to internet and the, or they don't have access to a device that would allow them to respond to an internet-based survey, which is what ours is. Um, and so in, for households that don't have these um, resources, we provide them. So we provide internet access and we provide tablets and that allows our survey to really be truly representative, uh, nationally representative, and including low-income families, those with less education, uh, those living in rural areas. So we're focusing, Morgan and I are focusing our work on um, the households with at least one K-12 child in the, in the house. And that's around 1,400, 1,500 families. Um, here I'm showing the comparison of our survey characteristics to the national population. And uh, we're very close on, on basically a number of dimensions. This is showing race, ethnicity, education level, and age. Um, we're within sort of four to six percentage points on each of these dimensions. But overall, the, the population, the parent population is very similar to the national population. We've administered nearly 20 waves or 20 different surveys to our sample over time since the beginning of the pandemic and counting. We have another, we have a survey in the field right now. We have another in October. Um, and this is really spanning the, the, the arc of the pandemic from school closures last year ago spring to summer, uh, figuring out what districts were going to do to a lot of uh, disparate responses to the pandemic this past year and looking forward to the next school year. So I'm going to show you, we're going to share kind of like some high points. Um, we're basically only scratching the surface, um, but we'll, we'll do what we can in 10 minutes. So last spring when, in, when schooling was going entirely online, um, access to internet and computers was pretty critical. Um, two, a third of the lowest income families didn't have access to a computer and internet compared to virtually all of the highest income families. Last summer, we asked parents their, their sort of feelings about various policy preferences or plans for the coming year. We found, for example, that um, less than half, 43% of our sample wanted to keep schools closed 
and remote only school the entire year. But there was a huge racial difference here. Uh, that was 43% overall, that that it was 32% among white families, double that 64% among black families. Uh, more as well in Hispanic and Asian American households. And this is a theme that we'll return to. Um, it comes back again and again through the year and Morgan will speak more about. By October, some parents rep reported improvements over the spring, though with a long way to go. So the, the, the takeaway from this graph is that um, parents' ratings of their child's education quality or school quality for in-person learning by last fall had basically rebounded back to pre-COVID. Um, but parent quality ratings for um, remote and hybrid instruction was, remained quite low. Um, so in the fall, we asked parents to grade their child's school pre-COVID in spring and in fall. Um, and uh, these, these grades really um, show, show, show differences in modalities. We saw the same pattern for science instruction, math instruction, and English language arts as well. Um, so I don't show that. This, this is, is showing um, that um, parents reported whether or not their child was receiving various services um, pre-COVID in April and October. And um, there were major, major dips in service provision, provision in April um, that rebounded somewhat by October, but not completely. So if you look at meals there, 40% um, of our sample had reported um, re receiving meals in February down to just over 20% by April and rebounded just to 30% by October. Similar patterns for other services. We asked parents about a host of policies. Um, this is just one, their, their feelings about standardized tests and support for canceling increased through the year. Uh, we asked them four times about this. Uh, we had overall high parent support for st canceling standardized tests across a range of subgroups. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I'm gonna pick up from uh, late fall through the present day. Um, so from November through June, um, we've been collecting data on uh, child attendance mode, parent preferences and school mitigation strategies. So one of our, uh, um, our main findings that's gotten the most attention and has been uh, analyzed by other researchers as well is about parent preferences for school modality. And we, we uh, saw really large and growing uh, gaps in particular between white and black and Latino families in terms of their preferences for in-person learning. So you can see here uh, that white families, especially by the late spring, were overwhelmingly preferring in-person learning and very different patterns for uh, black and Hispanic families uh, on the next two figures. Um, beyond these uh, enormous gaps in preferences, um, we've been collecting data quite recently um, about to, to sort of start helping us think about the next year. And we've collected data about school hesitancy and about parents' perspectives on various policy interventions. Um, so uh, one of the first sets of findings, which uh, was came out last week at, uh, at Brookings, um, was about parents' reasons for sending their for not sending their children back in person. So we've all heard about school hesitancy by now, and we wanted to understand what were the reasons driving parents' decisions for keeping their kids out of school. And what we found essentially were three buckets. We found about 30% of parents have reasons uh, pertaining to safety issues. Um, and those could be general safety issues or they could be COVID specific safety issues. About 30% of parents have reasons pertaining to fit issues like the schedule is better at home, or my child is doing just as well at home. And then about 30% express both of those um, kinds of issues, safety and fit, and then another 10% express other kinds of issues. And what this tells us is that it's not just about making schools safer by spacing kids out or putting in hygiene protocols, that there are other reasons that many parents are keeping their children out of school and, and schools and districts and states are gonna need to uh, pay attention to this if they wanna get kids back in person. Um, and we and we can see that these large racial differences in uh, in um, preferences that I expressed earlier are continuing into thinking about next year. So in particular, there are large gaps between black families and other families in terms of their preferences for in-person learning next year. So we see about 30% of black families report a preference for remote or that they're unsure about next year. 
versus just you know, 10 to 12% of white and Asian families and 17% of Hispanic families. And this is just uh, data collected a few weeks ago. Um, and we also started asking about um, these uh, kinds of interventions to address COVID related learning consequences. And what we found here, the sort of high level takeaway of this slide is um, two things. First, uh, only you know a quarter to a third of parents reported having been offered these things like tutoring or summer school. And then whether parents had been offered or had not been offered, uh, minorities of parents, relatively small minorities of parents said they were interested in or were planning to participate in these uh, activities. And we have a piece out just uh, earlier this week at the 74 that discusses these patterns. There's just not as much interest in these as I think policymakers might hope. So, um, uh, this is just a snapshot of some of the things that we've been able to do, and not all of these are ours. A lot of them are uh, articles using the UAS data or, or, or uh, articles reporting on research by other researchers who have used the UAS, the UAS data. So we've been able to produce really a ton with funding from NSF and a, and a few other sources as well. Um, and we have ongoing work. So we have planned surveys for uh, the summer, for June and the fall. Um, there's great opportunities to link the education data to the full UAS data set and, uh, and co other COVID related variables in the data set. Um, we're also planning on some, uh, you know, peer reviewed journal articles as well. That's what I was working on literally right before this call. Um, and I want to just put in a plug that these data are available for other people to use as well. And, and several scholars, um, most notably, Hema Zamaro and Andrew Camp have been using these data for a variety of uh, important analyses throughout the pandemic. And I really encourage you to go and take a look and consider whether you might be able to use these data yourself. So thank you very much uh, for giving us the time and I'm looking forward to the conversation later. Thank you, Anna and Morgan. That was uh, fantastic. Sean and, and Peggy, I'll give you a chance to get your slides up. Um, Really interesting findings, as well as a nice little plug for open science and open data, right? Increasingly, we live in a data-rich environment, and to the extent that you can make your data sort of open and available, downloadable, then you allow other scholars with different kinds of research questions to go in and, and analyze that data in a slightly different way. And so um, that's great. Next, we will hear from Sean Smith and Peggy Trickstad at Horizon Research. Their work has focused on a national survey of K-12 science teachers and their teaching of COVID-related content uh, throughout the pandemic, along with their experiences. Um, and I'll turn things over to Sean, I guess. Thank you, Rob. And I'm going to assume that my slides are actually showing unless somebody says something different. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just jump right ahead to uh, an acknowledgement here. Thank you to NSF very much uh, for their support. Thanks to the thousands of teachers who participated and thanks in particular to the RAPID program. Um, the fact that we and others were able to go from proposal to public presentation of results in under a year is, and some sooner than that, it's pretty amazing. Um, our research questions are listed here. We're very interested in where K-12 science teachers got their information about COVID. Again, our study was entirely about uh, whether teachers taught about COVID and the factors that influenced that. So how did teachers adapt their teaching, science teachers specifically? And then what factors shaped their response? We administered a survey in the spring of 2020 uh, to K-12 teachers of science and got about 2,300 responses. We also conducted in-depth interviews with 40 of those teachers um, later in the study. In terms of the quantitative data, which is what we'll be talking about today, we disaggregated those by grade range, by the subject of the class that teachers were answering about, whether it was a life science class or another kind of science class. Um, we also uh, analyzed by a number of what we we're calling equity factors. So the percentage of students qualifying for free and reduced lunch, percentage of students from underrepresented minority groups, the locale of the school, and then the political leaning of the county uh, in which the teachers were teaching. And I'm gonna turn it over to Peggy to start talking about some of our key findings. 
Yeah, so thanks, Sean. Um, we had obviously a number of findings. Um, these are some of the big ones that we wanted to share with you today. So the survey asked teachers about their science instruction both before and after school buildings closed. And um, as you can see on this slide, large percentages of science teachers um, addressed COVID um, before their school buildings closed at all three grade bands. Um, fast forward to um, after school buildings closed. And you'll see that um, middle and high school teachers continued to talk about COVID while there was a noticeable drop at the elementary level. Um, and we did a, some interviews, as Sean mentioned, with teachers. Um, and um, some of those interview data suggests that that drop was due to a lot of different factors, including student fatigue with the topic, um, teachers trying to just make sure those students didn't have um, overwhelming fear and anxiety about the situation and just pressure to teach to their standards once the school year was really disrupted and the mode of um, instruction changed. Um, we also asked teachers about the types of topics they addressed in their COVID instruction and um, combined those into some composite variables. Um, and the overwhelming um, majority of teachers talked about transmission, how COVID is transmitted across all grade bands. Um, other things such as treatment or more advanced topics were less commonly talked about, but as you might expect, those topics were more likely to be addressed in the, the later grades in high school than they were in elementary or middle school. Um, we also looked at the topics addressed by the equity factors that Sean mentioned and um, found that teachers in high poverty schools were actually more likely than those in low poverty schools to address all of these different topics, um, which was for us really an important and interesting finding because these are students and families who are likely living and working in situations that put them at risk for COVID, um, frontline retail workers and, and the like. Um, another interesting finding is that we asked teachers about um, student questioning and found that COVID instruction was really driven by student, student questions. And that in over 80% of classrooms, uh, teachers reported that students asked questions about COVID before they actually addressed it. And so this was a really uh, dominant mode of instruction is usually teachers asking questions that students answer. And this was really flipping that um, on its head. We also asked about student questioning um, and looked at that by the equity factors and found that um, there were two significant differences. Although the magnitude of these differences is small, um, teachers in schools with highest populations of URM students were more likely to indicate that their students asked question first um, and teachers in democratic leaning counties were likely to indicate that their students asked question first. We aren't entirely sure what these findings mean at this point, but um, but the fact that they're significantly different um, was interesting. Um, teachers were asked the types of questions students asked. Um, and we have some examples here and, and just some topic areas, but a lot of it was around transmission, how to keep themselves safe from uh, the transmission and where it came from, and then school changes, like for, will my school close? Will we ever go back to school? Um, those types of just everyday concerns. Teachers um, were teaching about COVID, but as this slide shows, they were really on their own to do so. Um, over half of elementary teachers reported that they created their own lessons for COVID instruction. And at the middle and high school levels, those numbers climbed even more, especially for life, life science teachers. Uh, nearly three quarters of those teachers created their own lessons to, to uh, address COVID. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Sean again to talk about one other piece of our findings. So one of the things we were really interested in doing in this study was trying to identify factors that influenced whether teachers would take up these, this topic of COVID because it seems to us that teachers serve a public health function in situations like this. So we wanted to see if we could learn what might happen, you know, God forbid, the next time around. If you're familiar with the theory of planned behavior, which was our theoretical framework, you'll probably recognize this as a very simplified representation where these four things on the left are factors that 
influence uh, intentions, which then influence behavior. But attitude is one's attitude toward teaching about COVID in this context. Subjective norm is about what others would think of a teacher teaching about COVID and then teachers own self-efficacy and their sense of control over that. And the behavior that we were seeing, looking to see whether we could predict is the amount of COVID instruction. So how many days of instruction uh, teachers gave to COVID. Um, we are also interested in some of these other factors that we've discussed. So the equity factors, as well as the subject of the class and whether the teacher had had a life science course beyond just an introductory course. We could probably spend hours speculating about all the relationships uh, in this, in this uh, chart here. Um, suffice to say, we tested pretty much all of them, but I'm just gonna talk about the ones that were significant. So it turned out that all of the uh, factors in the theory of planned behavior were significant and positive predictors of the amount of COVID instruction. Um, in addition, the subject of the class, if it was life science, teachers were more likely to give more time uh, to COVID instruction. This also influenced the amount of instruction through their sense of self-efficacy, as well as through their sense of control, which we think makes sense. Similarly, if teachers had had more than one life science class in college, it uh, both influenced the amount of instruction as well as their sense of self-efficacy. We did not find um, any relationships between the equity factors and the amount of instruction. However, the school locale and the political leaning uh, appear to influence the amount of instruction through teachers' attitudes, which from our perspective makes sense as well. And so I'm going to turn it back to Peggy for some closing thoughts. Yeah, just some final takeaways. Um, so as we mentioned, large percentages of students across grade bands had access to instruction about COVID. And when you looked at those um, instruction by equity factors that we mentioned, it appears that students generally had um, equal access to instruction about COVID. There were some small differences, but generally those, the magnitude of the differences was small. Um, however, science teachers were largely on their own to figure out what to teach and how to teach it um, with evidence by the fact that they were creating their own materials and their own lessons to, to talk about COVID. Um, we do see support for the theory of planned behavior in our data, but also evidence of a really complicated model of teacher decision making. And that also came out in interviews with teachers that um, yes, they were, um, you know, there were some key things that influenced whether or not they talk about, talked about COVID, but it was a really big network of interrelated concerns and considerations related to students and parents and families and the school, um, that it wasn't a simple decision or a simple situation. Um, and finally, just that science teachers served a, pub a public health function, that they were trying their best to uh, spread accurate information and to alleviate student concerns and to really give them the most accurate and up-to-date information they could in the middle of a really uncertain time. And that is all that we had. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate and um, we'd be happy to answer any questions later in the discussion. Thank you, Sean and Peggy. Really fascinating to look back and think about some of these issues. I mean, if we all think back like a year ago, the science was shifting and, and <laughs> the advice we were getting about how to navigate uh, behavior in the pandemic was shifting and teachers were teachers were having to you know sort of uh, make decisions um, in some cases with with like incomplete information as they try to provide instruction to students this is really fascinating work um, great discussion going on in the chat and i encourage the uh, sean and peggy and others to continue to, to weigh in um, it's really good uh, sort of continued discussion of the ideas. Um, lastly, we will hear in terms of the presenters, we'll hear from Robbie Callahan Schreiber and Marjorie Biquette at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Their research has focused on understanding how community members and educators collaborate to advance conversations around STEM and racial justice. Um, it's a slightly different um, issue they will take up, but um, just as important in my view. And um, 
then we will turn to our discussant. So I guess I'll go to you first, Robbie. Is that right? I'm actually going to kick us off and then turn it over to Robbie. Thank you so Excellent. much. I want to yep. just start with a huge thank you to NSF, both for inviting us here to join this group and for the funding for this project. As Rob said, we are going to feel a little different than the other projects. Uh, we are going to fo focus more on our process of how we did this work. And that's because our process was not that of doing a nationally run, carefully indexed survey. And this is a very small project, and it's a research practice partnership between our museum and a number of community members. We are here as representatives of the museum, and so we are missing a huge part of the perspective here. We had a handful of staff from the museum and 15 community members from across Minnesota and beyond working with us. And we also wanted to note that we are the two only white members of the project team in the museum and beyond. And we are here today and we are talking about this, but our perspective is necessarily limited because of our identities that we bring to this project. So Robbie, I'm gonna kick it over to you now for a little while. Thanks, Marjorie. Um, and I think uh, thinking about how schools, right, we're all part of our larger, uh, you know, community around us. We look at ourselves as the Science Museum as an organization uh, that uh, is seeking to connect with a broad spectrum of people across our communities in the Minnesota area and across even the region. Um, but for this purpose of this project, our goal was to collaborate to support community members to learn about process or take action to dismantle systemic racism. Uh, the work builds upon on our, our race, our research exhibit that we have that opened up in 2007. Uh, and we created three sm uh, small footprint exhibits that uh, we worked uh, several years ago to connect into three communities in greater Minnesota. So for this project, we worked with a small cohort of people from our Twin Cities metro area, a small cohort from Rochester, Minnesota and southeastern Minnesota, and then in northwestern Minnesota and the eastern North Dakota region, um, and connected with uh, individuals, small Small collectives of individuals rather than a specific organization or a ready-made uh, group that was there. Uh, the people representing the, the regional project groups uh, ranged from college age uh, younger people to community organizers to youth work professionals and uh, people working uh, within higher ed uh, and city systems. Uh, the real emphasis was on virtual um, engagements uh, given uh, the that this came up in the midst of the pandemic and that we received the funding shortly after the unrest uh, that took place in our communities and across the nation after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, and we were really looking into what supports would be useful um, from the museum and collaborating together to create virtual STEM informed activities that community members would come up with. Uh, look at how the museum as an organization could be sub a supportive partner or collaborator to reach uh, goals that community members articulate for themselves Themselves. And then looking beyond the funding window of this work, how can we provide resources to support uh, groups to be working together beyond the, the period of time that we have the funds? Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, from our museum's access and equity department, I uh, represent that with another staff member on this project. We really work hard to be thinking about setting up a structure that is more collaborative and co-creative. Um, and we had the fortune of working on a much smaller scale to be able to do that and really think deeply about balancing power, balancing decision-making processes, and ultimately ensuring that the project impact supports the communities with whom we're working and isn't just a, a supporting us as the organization to gather a bunch of information and just share out with more traditional uh, circles. Um, so I'll take a, another, just two more slides to talk about principles that we brought to the co-development process. Um, uh, we really, again, as I mentioned, focused on the relationship building aspects and had a variety of large group meetings to uh, small regional project group meetings and uh, made worked really, really deeply on centering trust building and communication among the groups of people, museum and community members, uh, and uh, used 
tools like use uh, Jamboards uh, and in the virtual meeting platform to be able to share ideas together. Uh, and when the groups were meeting individual uh, in their smaller regional groups to try to develop their activities, uh, they were uh, using a Meet platform uh, and really uh, spending time focusing on de uh, clearly determining what their what community members' responsibilities were with throughout the project and clearly identifying uh, for ourselves as the museum staff what responsibilities we would have. So we worked really hard on that early on. Uh, and then provided, since this is a research and practice project, uh, being clear from the beginning uh, what that what the different ways people could contribute to the project looked like and having people self-assign based on their capacity, their interest, their expertise to a variety of different roles throughout the project. Uh, I'll go on and talk about just several more principles that we had uh, and really making sure that if we're working collaboratively that the, the, the people contributing to the process uh, are the ultimate decision makers on what the project would be. Uh, that we are, are, even if folks you know, aren't coming into the project with the PhD or in a traditional NSF advisor role that we're paying people commensurate with their experience, that they were actively collaborating with us to develop this. Um, the community members were not just participants, but actual creators on the, in this work. Uh, and that uh, we need to be responsive to the changing needs of the communities at, uh, at hand. And so one example of that is working with our Farger Moorhead group who just said they wanted to create a survey uh, to survey their community to find to make the final decision on what activity they wanted to develop. The members of that five person group had uh, three options and ultimately after creating that survey, uh, the community members they surveyed were decided on their actual their third choice, uh, but that they agreed to the process and followed that uh, and ended up creating an activity that, that their community members that they were representing wanted to uh, work on. Um, my last piece will just be sharing what it is that's been <laughs> developed and created. Uh, our group from Fargo-Moorhead uh, created a, a day-long youth leadership development workshop for uh, high school and college age young people um, called Honoring Our Minds in Exhaustive Spaces, recognizing uh, that they really wanted to focus on supporting themselves. And again, in this time of COVID where people's lives have been so deeply impacted that they, they needed to um, provide a restorative development space for each other. Um, in Rochester, uh, we have a, a web game called Not So Trivial Pursuit focused on career pathway development and uh, identity uh, intersecting it with that. And in Twin Cities, the group has developed a seven uh, episode uh, podcast series having uh, in, uh, interviewing young people and older people across the Twin Cities about racial justice issues that are important uh, to them. Uh, we do have a project website uh, uh, pointing to the, the importance of transparency and doing this work and sharing out uh, what we're learning and, and processes that we're using. Um, that smm.org slash STEM racial justice is a website we've created with uh, documentation uh, that, that we've taken throughout the project. And I'll pass to Marjorie. So uh, as the lead researcher on this project, we began knowing that we wanted to, again, co-create the research with the community, just as Robbie described, co-creating the activities. The three principles we followed, which should not be a surprise to any of you as expert researchers, we began our project really talking with our community members about the, the deep history of research with BIPOC communities and setting our intention and giving them space to push back when we did not achieve our intention of centering their experience and allowing them to have control over their story, their data. As Robbie described, again, in the research, we really tried to identify that the researchers have expertise, but community members bring different and equally important expertise about their communities, their needs, the ways things are likely to work or not work, and the history that is present in each place. And how did we do it? Uh, I will say it was a little bit of a bumpy road here and there, but we sent out big calendars at the beginning, helped people to understand the many ways that they could be involved, gave them space to be involved, and um, allowed them to step back when they focused on other things. And as Robbie mentioned, all of these are people with full-time jobs. And so trying to create a space for equal engagement from somebody who's already working 40 hours a week elsewhere was often a challenge. Mm -hmm. So finally, I 
there were moments in this process where Robbie and I sort of said, why are we with these big surveys and, and what do we have to offer to the DRK-12 audience specifically? And this is where we ended up. We want to think about the ways that the, the nature of our organization is actually similar to many of the organizations that you all are working with, whether that's universities, whether that's K-12 schools, the pushing to recenter whose vision is being held and how that is played out in everyday projects continues to be important. And then the other piece, this was a rapid grant and it was in response to COVID in that the events of the civil unrest across the country are related to COVID, but they're also related to the deep history of racial injustice in the United States. And some might say that this was maybe not the time to dive into a project like this, but we felt like it was even more the time to dive into a project that really forced us to set our own museum-based assumptions aside as practitioners and researchers and work to engage with others. So thank you. Great, thank you, Robbie and Marjorie. Really interesting work in, in Minnesota and in that part of the country, that's fantastic. Um, the conversations and discussions continuing in the chat are great. A reminder, when you enter a question, do it to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see. And then we'll do our best to respond in the same way. Uh, we're, finally, we're pleased to be able to be joined by Dr. Pedro Noguera. He is the Dean of the University of Southern California School of Education. He is the author of numerous books and manuscripts focusing on racial equity, social justice, local community change, and education. I will now turn things over to him and invite additional questions and comments in the chat. And we hope to have a few minutes after Dr. Noguera talks for uh, some broader discussions and questions. So I'll turn things over to you, thank you. Thank you, Rob. And uh, thank you, NSF, for your fast action in commissioning these papers, which um, were timely and important and start to shed light on such a complex uh, and uh, you know a, a year that we're gonna remember for years and years to come. Um, <clears throat> I do wanna really encourage people uh, to, to check out the comments and questions in the chat, particularly from my former colleague, uh, Marsha Lynn, who probably would have been a better discussant than me because um, I just looking at Marsha's comments, um, really insightful and wanna encourage people to take a look. Um, <clears throat> as I was listening to the three papers, um, first, let me just say something about Anna and Morgans. Um, I, I think in the debate that we've been hearing about schools reopening. Um, and it's played out very differently because we know 50% of kids were in school all year. <laughs> and uh, it's really been an urban phenomena, right? That is of schools not being open. And the irony was that the families most affected by the pandemic, both in terms of uh, the chance of getting the, 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 the uh, infection and the chance of the uh, really experiencing severe economic hardships showed the, also the least access to learning and um, the, the greatest uh, reluctance to return. And this is, a, a, I think, a, a topic that we're gonna need to mine further because uh, as schools reopen, what's clear is it's not like uh, turning on the lights that suddenly families and children reappear. Uh, there are a lot of issues and uh, one of the big ones is whether or not schools will be responsive to the needs of the families they serve. Uh, and one of the concerns I've had is the primary focus of many superintendents has been on the logistics of reopening, not on how do we address the needs that kids have had and how do we make school better than it was. Um, and I think for many families, uh, this is gonna be a real issue and potentially an obstacle. And we're already seeing Many schools saying they're gonna to have to be on a hybrid model uh, because if they lose too many kids, um, they really uh, won't be able to function. So I wanna encourage uh, the, the ongoing analysis of this data um, because I think it reveals a lot about what the future may hold. Uh, <clears throat> with, with Sean and Peggy, I was really interested in, in, in the fact that so much of the learning was student driven and that teachers were responsive 
to questions that came from student, um, their students about the pandemic um, and allowed that in many cases to drive uh, what was taught. This is, uh, I think, encouraging because as we know over the last several years, standards, academic standards sent down to us have determined a lot of what kids are learning and exposed to. Um, this, if, if nothing, 2020 had lots of teachable moments. Uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic was only one of them. And as we heard from Marjorie and Robbie in their paper, the racial justice movement, think about the political insurrection. There were so many things that kids needed to learn about during this period that as events unfolded, if schools did not respond, um, schools became more and more irrelevant. Um, so while Sean and Peggy's paper focused mostly on how they incorporated lessons about the pandemic, I'm as curious to know to what degree they were able to respond to other events that were occurring. Um, I, I think, for example, millions of people across the world, including many children, were able to witness and see the murder of George Floyd. Talk about a teachable moment. How, what would have happened if kids had been in school and want to talk about it when it came back? How would teachers have been prepared for that kind of discussion? Um, so for those who've been um, studying standards and, and, and understanding how do standards affect learning, I think uh, Sean and Peggy's paper is really insightful um, because it, it does, I think, show um, under what conditions can teachers make uh, uh, changes to what kids are learning and what kids are uh, um, uh, thinking about in school that are, we rise uh, occur in response to what's happening around them. Um, the issue of relevance and, and how, uh, how to make school more um, uh, timely and, and relevant to the needs of kids um, is an ongoing issue and concern. I think that all of us have been uh, thinking about for a long time. So thank you for that. And then uh, Marjorie and, and, and Robbie, just wanna say, um, you know, the only person who predicted the revolution would start in Twin Cities was Prince. And uh, unless you're a Prince fan, um, you won't know the reference, but uh, you know, who knew? And so to have your institution as a leader in collecting data with communities about what was going on um, there is, is, I think, really important. So I'm really glad you were part of this work. I'm, I'm hoping and looking forward to seeing the analysis and the findings that emerge from that work, because uh, I think there's so much we could learn from the Twin Cities. The uh, level of political turmoil um, just this week, there was another uh, incident uh, of violence there um, that we can learn about how that, that impacts children and learning is so important. So I wanna encourage you to continue with that work, that research and continue to share what you're learning with others because uh, even though it's very local, um, I think what's happened in the Twin Cities um, is, is really relevant to all of us. So thank you for uh, leading that work and just thank all the papers and again, uh, NSF for um, commissioning this work. There's so much research about what's happened. Um, I, I just hope that there are many other researchers that were able to do this kind of work uh, because I think we have a lot to learn from this period uh, for, for years to come uh, that will influence the way we approach education and many other things. So thank you. Look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. Um, I, I do wanna to turn to some questions in the chat that have been posed. I think we could, some of them are ripe for a larger discussion here. Um, I just um, maybe open it up to the presenters if anybody has anything pressing they want to add at this time based on, on uh, what's been said. No, okay. Um, I think uh, a good place to start might be Ellen's question, which she posted in the chat and I'll, I'll read it. It says, what are the enduring understandings from your COVID related work that you think can apply to future research and practice in the grade bands or the context that you studied over the past 15 months? Um, and that's a, just put that out to, to the whole group, sort of implications for the work going forward. Um, what sort of lessons have been have been gleaned, um, and I'll open that up to anybody who wants to weigh in. Um, I'll say something <laughs> briefly about uh, the 
the school hesitancy things and the Pedro touched on as well. I mean, I, I, you know, this is, this is a huge issue, right? So we don't yet have the answers for um, uh, how to get kids back into whatever educational setting is going to work best for them. I think that, you know, what's clear is that some non-trivial percentage of families is preferring uh, online learning during the pandemic, which I think is not necessarily what people expect or want to hear, but it's a reality that we now, I think, have to live with. And I just saw a stat this morning. It was something like 50-something percent of school districts are, are going to be offering some kind of online option. So, you know, we, we've got to figure out how to do this well. I mean, uh, as well as possible, uh, you know, in my opinion, that comes with very strong state guidance or maybe state-provided options uh, that, that take the burden off of the hands of, you know, 13,000 individual school districts. But, um, but whatever it is that we do, we just need to ensure that that, that option is, is high quality and is meeting the needs of the parents who are preferring that option. And frankly, we also need to have some kind of really robust and careful measurement. And, you know, I don't think big A accountability, but small A accountability to understand, you know, how are kids actually doing in this setting, right? We can't just assume that because, frankly, because parents say that it's better for their kids, that it actually is better for their kids. And, and we, mm -hmm. we need to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Anna. Yeah, I'm on the same, I'm, you know, Morgan and I talk a lot. I'm on the same page with all that. And then the other side of this result here that, you know, we, this, these reasons for why parents aren't sending their children back have been so important. So there's the safety reason and then there's a fit reason. On the safety side, schools and districts can, can really uh, communicate a lot with their, with their parents and students and teachers about, you know, for example, what are the weekly case rates? And if there's zero, 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 that can help build trust and safety. But on the, on the, on the fit side, I mean, this is, this is a huge deal. This means that there's a sizable population of parents um, and children who feel, and, and they're more, more likely to be black families and children who feel that even though remote learning was so hard and parents were trying to juggle a million things and kids weren't interacting with their peers in person, even though there are all these downsides to remote learning, it was still better than in-person learning. I mean, that's a huge, huge statement. And that means that on the one hand, there's all Morgan was saying about improving remote instruction. On the other hand, we have to improve in-person learning um, because you know, done well, that could be a much better option. So that means improving dilapidated buildings, improving ventilation, improving infrastructure. You know, it means really like really changing disciplinary policies. It means really, really uh, addressing structural racism in the classroom. Um, it means you know, really understanding from parents what, what are the reasons for why that fit is better remote and addressing them in person. Great, thank you, that's excellent. Other folks wanna weigh in on that question? I, was ju I would just add that uh, in writing the proposal and the, the project proposal, I assumed that the projects would have a more directly articulated COVID focus, uh, but the projects that the groups worked on were not explicitly calling that out. And I think it just has me thinking about the, you know, if, if we as the practitioners or the professionals, you know, ha have an, sort of, you know, bias or an idea about People are going to want to focus on a very specific thing that there are so many different intersecting experiences in this that you know in our case folks were focusing more on the racial justice aspects of that mm -hmm. but in hearing the previous presenters talk about you know teachers taking on the role of public health uh you know practitioner in some respects there's then becomes a danger of our educators our teachers you know having yet another role lumped on to them and i think it just give for me and continued interest in that collect learning more about collective impact and uh, some people wrote in the, uh, some questions about or posed the acronym RPP of you know doing more uh, collective uh, collaborations among several different institutions to support the, the needs of, of families as they're articulating. Thank you Peggy I see maybe yeah. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say that our study really highlighted um, the role of teachers as um, public health um, sources of information about public health and public public health educators. And especially striking was the fact that students went to their science teachers with questions about COVID, especially 
even teachers that weren't life science teachers, they went to their physics teachers and they went to, you know, their environmental science teachers and all of these other types of teachers. And so um, finding kind of what do we need to do in schools to enable teachers to talk about these really timely, current, important events when they arise and uh, creating space for those conversations. Because when we ask teachers why, who didn't address COVID, why? I mean, there's a lot of pressure to teach to their standards. They just didn't feel like they had enough time. In some schools and districts, they were forbidden to talk about it. And so just, um, you know, giving teachers the support they need to really cover these topics with students and how to do it. Just to add one thing to what Peggy said, this was in one of our slides, but the most common topic teachers talked about was transmission and how to prevent it. And that just to me speaks volumes about what kinds of questions kids were asking and what kind of function teachers were serving during the pandemic. Great, um, thank you. We still have time for additional questions. I'm looking um, in the chat. Um, Rob, I wonder um, yep. if there could be some comment, because although you talked a lot about a high number of African-Americans who are reluctant, Asian Americans are showing the greatest reluctance of, of all groups. Um, that's true, not just, uh, I think nationally that's true. And I'm wondering if anyone wanna comment on that because we know there's been a lot of anti-Asian um, um, sentiment and actions um, in the last few uh, months as well. I think in our data, what if I, Anna can correct me, she might note, and I don't have the table directly in front of me, although actually I might be able to find it while I'm talking, um, that, uh, that Asian parents have been very reluctant um, during the pandemic, during this school year, but in terms of next school year, there's much more enthusiasm for going back, I think, because I would assume that is at least in part because Asian families are very likely to be vaccinated relative to other groups. Um, but, uh, but yes, during the pandemic, let me see if I can pull up. Um, so I'm looking right now at uh, parent preferences from like November. And what we see is um, only 15%. Yeah, so black and Asian families were both at 15% preferring in person back in November, December both between 26 and 28% in February, March, and between 29% and 30% preferring in-person in April, May. So Pedro, you're correct about this previous school year. I think moving into the next school year, Asian families are more enthusiastic about returning to um, school, but, but certainly you're, you're also right about the issues that Asian Americans have been experiencing in terms of increased racism and uh, discrimination over the course of the last year, which, you know, we don't really know how that's going to play out, but there's no reason to think that it would add between now and the start of the school year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of concerns, we've seen a, like higher concerns and host of, we actually haven't published on this yet, so we're working on this right now, just like looking into um, concerns about academics, about social, emotional, uh, mental health, um, and we have seen um, higher <clears throat> concerns from Asian American families in a host of areas. Thank you. Okay, slightly different question here, and um, the, it says, how can we support just-in-time curriculum design as we see in this work? What are the ways to capitalize on the energy that each teacher brings to the table? And I assume the we um, may refer to the DRK-12 community, right, sort of education research community, that's my sense, but any take on that in terms of how do we be most supportive for um, curriculum needs on the ground? Maybe Sean or Peggy, I don't know if you have a sense of that from a teacher standpoint, if you any nuggets from the data. Well, actually, I, I'm going to speak from another rapid program, which was Troy Sadler and colleagues work. Mm, um, yeah. And they, they turned around a curriculum of resources for teaching about COVID very quickly. And they've written about this and mm -hmm. you can read about, 
Um, but the model that they used, uh, again, turned around materials pretty quickly. Teachers weren't aware of those, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's as one of the things that, that we have been advocating for is enlisting the help of the um, health organizations like CDC and NIH, uh, curating not necessarily classroom materials, but just information for teachers so that they have a place to go and they're not having to sift through materials for uh, employers and hospitals and so and so, but here, teachers, here's something especially for you. Sean, I would just add to that, we actually had a, a second rapid working with a local podcast to understand the ways that informal science can support families and kids in and out of school. And the Brains On podcast, which is designed for younger students, has done a remarkable job. And there are other materials like that outside the curriculum world. And um, ours was not a representative sample. It really was looking at the brains on audience. But what we found with that group was how much kids were worrying about the social implications of COVID on their lives. The questions that they asked to the podcast and then that parents reported to us that they were asking were incredibly focused on how long do I have to keep on not seeing my friends, wearing a mask, doing school over an iPad, doing all of these things. And so Brains On did a really nice job of balancing. So I love the idea of developing some resource lists and would just encourage us to look in the curricular world and beyond when we have to move so quickly here. Yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, I had two young boys at home and, and you just get a glimpse into what teachers are doing and what resources they're leaning on. And you, I mean, they're super creative and they're going to resources like that, you know? Um, that may not be fully designed for K-12, but I think in this kind of climate context, you know, teachers in many cases had quite a bit of flexibility to do things and point to resources and, and make instructional moves, um, you know, in those virtual environments um, in that way. So yeah, that's really interesting. Um, all right, well, we are almost out of time. Um, you know, I think that the discussion has been fantastic. The Q and A in the chat has been great. Um, you know, we as an, as a funding agency um, have been delighted to support this work. It has been really influential for the field. Um, you know, we continue um, in some cases to support additional rapid projects if the case can be made that it's timely and important and couldn't be submitted to like the regular DRK-12 or other competition. Um, so, but um, I just, I want to thank all the presenters and, and thank Dr. Naguera for joining us and, and his comments as well. Everything, uh, the discussion has been so fascinating um, and timely. Um, want to be cognizant of your time because I know there's a, there's a session beginning at, at two o'clock. Um, this session uh, you can share with colleagues. Um, we invite you to um, tag it in social media, whatever platform you use. Um, and I think the recording will be available in the meeting platform, but certainly enjoy the rest of the PI meeting. Um, and hopefully you've, you've picked up a couple of things from this session to carry forward in your own work. Um, thank you again.